Okay, so we've had a couple of talks on Fire Drake um, features, and this talk will be very much about one single application, so less theory and, and more figures, I guess. Um, so we're interested in modeling density driven coastal ocean flows, and this work has, has been carried out at the Center for Coastal Margin and Observation, Observation Prediction at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, so to begin with, just an overview of the, the problem that we're dealing with. So we're interested in looking at um, the coastal ocean, currents there, and then the estuaries and the rivers all combined in a um, kind of a multi-scale problem. And numerically, this is rather complex to solve because of the, first of all, the complex topography. So you have a complex... Um, coastlines, you have all sorts of islands and channels in the estuaries, and also the physics, you have a really wide scale of, of scales that you need to capture. So on the coastal currents, they have time scales that reach up to one year, and they are of order 100 kilometers in horizontal size, but then when you go to the estuary, you have tidal flows, you have features that are of 100 meters in, in, in size, and you know tides can be... Um, the processes can be up to one minute in, in time. Um, and these flows are very strongly advection dominated. So this example is the Columbia River estuary, where you can get uh, tidal currents up to three meters per second near the mouth during the apps. Um, and at the same time, you get strong density gradients because you get strong fresh, fresh water coming in from the river and then saline water uh, from the ocean. So you can get you can go from 0 to 32 PSU in, in really short um, scales in horizontal and vertical. And the practical salinity unit. Um, so, yeah, just the density, essentially. Uh, so the baroclinics effects are really important, so the density does matter here. And here's just an illust illustration. This is from a circulation model in 3D showing that during the, big, uh, the flood side you get the saline water creeping into the system in the bottom of these channels and you can get really strong density gradients there. And we see them in the observation. So this is from AUV, so a robotic instrument that is swimming back and forth in the channel. And you see that there are strong density gradients, especially in the vertical direction. In a couple of meters you go from uh, oceanic water to pure fresh water. And then when you look at our models, our models are have some difficulty in capturing this because they tend to be diffusing those uh, density gradients. So in, in, in many ways, this kind of modeling boils down to accurate tracer advection schemes so that you're able to capture those strong gradients. And other uh, model properties that you need to have, obviously mass and volume conservation, you need um, stability under baroclinic uh, conditions you need a mesh that tracks the free surface movements. You need wetting and drying because um, there are areas in the, in the estuary that go dry during low tide. And then you also need some sort of turbulence closure scheme to take into account the vertical mixing that depends on the stratification. OK. Um, so our goal here is to implement a model with these features on top of fire drake. And uh, the goal is to have low numerical diffusivity, flexible implementations, which is why we're interested in fire drake, and of, of course computationally efficient, computational efficiency. So basically our idea is to simulate these estuarine flows for like 10 year scales. So, and the time step with explicit time integrators is maybe 10 seconds or 30 seconds. So it's computationally demanding problem. Um, Okay, so I'll just quickly go through the equations. So we're solving, solving Navier-Stokes with hydrostatic and Businesque approximations. So you get a horizontal momentum equation for the horizontal component of the velocity field, which is just normal advection, uh, Coriolis term, external pressure gradient, internal pressure gradient that depends on the vertical density structure, and then uh, horizontal viscosity and vertical viscosity. Um, then, since we're hydrostatic, the vertical momentum equation boils down to just the continuity. So you get your 
vertical velocity w diagnostically from this equation. And um, in coastal ocean flows, it's common to uh, separate the 2D and 3D dynamics because the free surface waves travel at least an order of magnitude faster than the 3D dynamics. So from a, a computational effi efficiency perspective, it makes sense to solve the 2D mode separately from the 3D mode. And therefore, you also embed the normal 2D depth average shallow water equations. The only difference with the normal depth average shallow water equations is that in here you also have the contribution from the density. So you have the vertical integral of the in, uh, internal pressure gradient there. Um, then you uh, have treasure equations for temperature and salinity. So this is just normal advection diffusion. And these two will then contribute to the density through the equation of state. And finally, you will um, close the system with turbulence closure models that will give you the vertical uh, eddy viscosity and diffusivities. So um, one difficulty here is that uh, you have a bunch of different equations that you need to couple together, and part of them are in 2D mode, and part of them are in 3D. Um, and we are solving these on uh, vertically un uh, extruded meshes. So on horizontal, you have uh, unstructured mesh, either triangles or quads, extruded in the vertical direction to separate the horizontal and vertical dynamics. And the mesh gets fitted to the, the bathymetry and also the movement of the free surface. So, so yes, this is um, relevant to both of the previous talks. So it's a non-affine mesh in the, in the general case. And you have the extrusion there. Um, and the grid spacing can be uniform or it can be adapted to the can be adapted to the uh, density structure of the, of the estuary or the coastal ocean. And in general, we'd also like to have a multiple, a variable number of vertical levels, so not only constant uh, everywhere in the domain. And one feature I mentioned already is that the mesh is moving in the vertical direction to track the, the free surface, and we use arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian formulation for this. Um, so I guess I have an animation for this that I should be pulling out. So this is just, just to illustrate. Um, the moving mesh. So this is just a, a barotropic wave in a channel. And you see that the uh, uh, 3D mesh adapts to the, the uh, free surface as the wave is going back and forth. And we need this in the coastal ocean because um, the free surface waves are the same order of magnitude as the depth, essentially. And another thing uh, that we need is we need to be able to communicate data between the 2D modes and 3D modes. So first of all, you need to in compute um, vertical integrals and averages in the 3D mesh, and then um, extract either the surface layer of the 3D mesh or the bottom layer of the 3D mesh and feed that to the 2D mode, or then copy 2D fields and feed them into the 3D containers. Um, then about the, the finite element spaces uh, that we use. So essentially, when you think about the horizontal direction, this is just shallow waters on, on rotating frame. So we want to use element pairs that have been shown to be stable for rotating shallow water. So for example, the P1DG P2 pair. Or another option would be to use um, the recent mimetic elements that he discra uh, discussed in Mac McRae and, and Cotter, for instance. Um, and the interesting point here is that the, um, the way you map your gradients and divergences. So in the first case, your pressure will be P2, so the gradient will be in P1 dG, so you can evaluate that point-wise, whereas the divergence you'd, you'd be doing with um, weekly with uh, um, integrating by parts. But with the mimetic elements, it's actually the opposite. So the, the gradient of the pressure you want to do weekly and the, the 
divergence will, will directly fit the pressure space. Um, okay, so this is just in 2D. Then when you go to 3D, um, everything follows in a, in a pretty straightforward manner, if I can get the next slide. Um, so for the horizontal velocity, you use, use the 2D velocity space and then a certain vertical uh, space of your choice. And, and based on this, you will get your vertical velocity that um, lives in the pressure space in horizontal and an integral of the previous vertical space. And that is just the way the, because of the continuity equation that you use to solve the vertical velocity. And then finally, you get the traces that will be in the same pressure space and then the original vertical space that you used for the horizontal velocity as well. So basically, once you choose your 2D element pair, you kind of get your 3D uh, elements as well. So in the first case, P1, DG, P2, your horizontal velocity would then be uh, purely discontinuous. Vertical velocity would be P2, P2 and traces would be partially um, or continuous in the horizontal direction. Um, and then for the mimetic element pair, you, you'd be um, Raviathoma in the horizontal for horizontal velocity discontinuous over the vertical. And then in this case, your traces would be purely discontinuous. So this is an interesting um, point because we're, we're looking at advection dominated flows. So uh, the choice of the tracer space is really important, so um, you're either being at least partially continuous or purely discontinuous based on the, on the element pairs that you choose. Um, so a bit more about the advection. So this is an Eulerian method, obviously, so the advection term needs to be stabilized somehow. So if, in the first case, you have continuous traces in the horizontal, you need some sort of linear stabilization, like SUPG but you will get overshoots because you have high advection and uh, strong gradients. So you need to add some sort of nonlinear diffusion there. And the, the difficulty with this is that these two methods may be in conflict each, with each other. And it's a, a bit easier with the discontinuous traces. So you, then you can just do normal upwinding or lax Friedrich flux to keep it stable and then do add slope limits as some sort of nonlinear diffusion to suppress the, the oscillations in the traces field that you, you ha might have. Um, okay, so for this reason, for the rest of the talk, I'm just considering the mimetic element pair for the test case that I'm, I'm looking at. So to summarize the stabilization for the tracer advections I used, the, inter the interface flux is just normal upwinding but I'm adding the lax Friedrich penalization term there to add a little bit of diffusion on the interfaces to suppress the overshoots. But on top of that, there's a nonlinear diffusion that depends on the jump of the discontinuous traces. And um, the local velocity magnitude and the horizontal element size, essentially. Now, this sort of uh, stabilization would be enough for passive traces, but it gets a bit more complicated when you have strongly baroclinic flows, so where the density structure is affecting the uh, velocity. And it has been shown that in baroclinic flows, you get additional noise in your velocity field that is roughly on the grid scale. And you need to add some sort of viscosity to keep it stable. And this is uh, discussed in the Ilizak paper 2012, for instance. And what, what I did here, I just added Smargrinsky viscosity there. That depends on the rate of the strain tensor and the uh, horizontal element size. And then the, the parameter CS can be chosen so that, such that your mass Reynolds number is, is small enough so that um, you, you can uh, suppress those uh, velocity oscillations. Okay, so this is more or less the, the spatial discretization, then just very briefly about the time integration. So we have multiple equations, um, so we need to come up with a couple time integrator scheme 
what I'm showing here is something relatively simple. So strong st stability uh, preserving the third order runge kutta method for, um, for the 3D mode for the traces and also for the 3D momentum equation. And then we need to do something compatible in the 2D mode. Um, and uh, what I've essentially done here is I'm using the same uh, three-stage scheme from the, for the 2D mode, but I'm treating the terms that are related to the free surface uh, semi-implicitly to allow for longer time steps in the 2D mode. So there's a bunch of different ways you can do it, but that, that's a simple approach that I implemented here. Um, so then to a test case, so I tested this uh, with a bunch of different baroclinic test cases, but I'm going to show the classical hydrostatic log exchange. So you have 64 kilometer long channel that is 20 meters deep. And initially there's a, a wall that separates like dense water mass and a light water mass. And as you, you run the simulation, you get this bi-directional exchange flow where the dense water is creeping underneath the, the light water and, and so forth. Um, this is also discussed in the Ilizak paper. This is their result for MIT GCM. And this is the result from our new model implemented in FireDrake with the discretization just described. And this is our, our previous uh, circulation model. And, and we see that um, the new model reproduces the correct solution here. You can, oh, this is the wrong one, okay. Well, you see that the, the model is able to reproduce the correct uh, wave, the front propagation speed that you theoretically get, and, and also the numerical diffusivity is comparable to what we see in literature with other models. And, and this animation shows the artificial diffusivity term that we added for the tracer field to suppress the oscillations. And here we have the Smagorinsky viscosity that, that suppresses the noise in the velocity field. And you see that, well, it gets relatively high numbers. So your mesh Reynolds number is around five, I guess, in here. But it's really confined only in the areas where you see those sharp, sharp uh, shocks in the solution. So it, it works pretty nicely, actually. Um, and it also scales well as you refine the mesh. Um, and this is just a histogram of the nodal values of the solution after 17 and a half hours into the simulation. And you see that clearly the, the two different water masses, 20 and 25 for the density. A little bit of diffusion in between, which is normal. And the overshoots are very small. There, there's a bit of overshoots but the nonlinear diffusivity is, is, is doing a pretty good job um, suppressing them. Okay, so these were just um, very early results on the, the Baroclinic uh, flow solver. So the next step is to continue doing rigorous testing for these different spatial discretization and time steppers, trying to figure out how do we get uh, best possible accuracy with uh, less. Um, computational cost. And the one interesting problem to deal with is to get a, a strict tracer monotonicity so that we can get rid of those overshoots. The ALE moving mesh formulation needs a bit of work as well. And there's certainly a lot of things to do with the optimization. I haven't really worked on that so far. And two uh, model development tasks that I haven't really touched uh, are the turbulence closure schemes and then the wetting and drying that also needs to be addressed. Um, and then in terms of fire drake, what this means is that, well, for these prisms, we need the non-affine elements that uh, Andrew talked about. So when we have a non-orthogonal or non-trivial extrusion with, with bathymetry, for instance, it would also be nice to have a better IO in fire drake where you can store the model state in the native discretization so that you can restart your simulations, and you can do post-processing with the native fields, for instance. Um, another issue is that as you have this moving mesh, 
updating the solvers after the mesh update is a bit expensive because you need to reassemble your systems and I don't know if there's uh, any way to speed it up. And the last point um, is slope limiters. So I haven't worked on slope limiters so far, but I think in the end it would be, to, it would be interesting to at least see if, if how, they, how they perform. Okay, so um, that's all I had. Thanks for your time and thanks for all the great libraries that you're building. Makes my life a lot easier and thanks all for the colleagues here at Imperial who have been helping me to, to put this up. Thanks. Yeah, so the, so the uh, ALE formulation is, is pretty easy, especially in these kind of cases where the mesh movement is rather simple, only in one, one direction. Um, I've implemented previously on, on, on other fire, uh, finite element uh, solvers, and it wasn't too, too difficult to get around to. Um, so... Yeah, there's, there's two forms of ALE. You can do the conservative or the non-conservative one. The non-conservative one is, is very easy to do. If you do the conservative one, then you get um, your mass matrix starts to depend on time and you need to handle that. But um, it hasn't been a problem so far. 